Welcome to another In Wheel Time podcast, a 30-minute mini version of the In Wheel Time car show that airs live every Saturday morning, 8 to 11 a.m. Central. Max Anywhere. Podcasting and streaming worldwide, it's the In Wheel Time car talk show. Just ahead, Ann Renke, CEO of TIA, Transport Intermediaries Association. Cool. Uh, Ann has a career-long association with American transportation in the private sector and with the U.S. Department of Transportation as well. Very smart lady, and we're going to talk to her. Conrad will have the In Wheel Time Car Clinic, and we'll also have this week's Auto News. Howdy, along with Mike, out of this world, Mars. King Conrad DeLong. We always need more Jeff Zekin. I'm Don Armstrong. Thanks so much for joining us on our live broadcast. And if you're listening or watching on the stream, we thank you for that as well. All right. Let's just get right to it. Uh, Anne, I uh, heard that you're pronouncing your last name Renke. Am I That's cor- good enough. Yeah, I'll take it. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. <laughs> well, thank you. And it's an honor to talk to you. Your, uh, your, your career is really something. And I want to tell everybody, 16-year career in Washington, D.C., the office of CSX. You know who CSX is? I have no idea. Okay. Trains. Pardon me? Trains. Trains, yeah, exactly. Uh, she ultimately became vice president, government affairs there, overseeing the federal state government and community affairs departments. She received a BA from Rice University Ooh, right here in right. Houston. Yay. Yeah. That's that- the most important part of my resume. That's it. Go right Owls. There. Yeah, the Owls. So you were you a fighting owl? Did you play volleyball or anything? Passive owl. <laughs> uh, I was on the sidelines being very encouraging as we lost – to everyone, in the <laughs> that's so you're a Cowboys fan. <laughs> oh no, God, no. God, no! Oh Lord, well. So, Ann, tell us what what is TIA Transportation Intermediaries Association? What does that company do? Sure. So we're an association representing brokers and third party logistics companies. And so, who are they? They're the they're what we call the middlemen, the people who are in the center of the supply chain between the shipper. So some of your your members, I would assume, you know, auto dealers, automakers on the one hand, and then carriers and other modes of transportation on the other. We're putting the two together. So we have members who would work with the GMs of the world. Um, and then we have members who would do all kinds of things from hazmat to fresh food to what have you. And then they work to contract with the truck driver mostly. We're about 80% truck facing, and we have about 2,000 members. The logistics industry is about a $276 billion industry. It's one of those industries that no one knew about until really until the pandemic. And when, when people said, where the heck is my toilet paper and my cereal and wherever else, they're like, oh, wait, there's a whole supply chain. So it, we benefited a little bit from the pandemic in that regard. Well, and I have to tell you, and you know this from being here in Houston for a while, that uh, Houston is uh, a huge port. Uh, yeah, we have yeah. a huge port here, and we also have a very huge rail presence here. Yes. Matter right. of fact, the call letters of uh, KPRC Channel 2 and KPRC Radio, Cotton Port and Rail Center. Oh, and uh, there you go. and, and all, all of us have been caught up in some sort of, you know, a train's blocking a, in an intersection or whatever. Yes. But the trains in and out of Houston is tremendous. We have two major trail yards up on the northeast side of town. And th- yeah, if you were to fly over them, you go, oh my gosh, I had no clue that it was that big. So uh, we're very much in tune with the transportation part of your job, especially here in the Houston area. So do you have any, well, you clearly have something to do with shipping as well, because once the ship gets here, you got to get it to wherever else it's going to go. That's right. And so, you know, I was thinking about our interview and our discussion today and how we align. And so part of it is the customers that we have, right, the the automakers, et cetera. But part of it, too, is we're really interested in what the future of transportation is in terms of is it going to be automation, right? So you are looking at automated vehicles. I'm sure you have a lot of thoughts about that. We're thinking about what does automated trucks do for us? Does that work from a safety perspective since we're the ones hiring the truck? Is that actually going to benefit the shipper and the end user to have an automated vehicle? There's lots of pros and cons. We can talk about that. And then the other part, which I think I caught a little bit of, is this EV mandate, which, as you know, in California, God knows everything bad happens. It starts in California. <laughs> they, they have this EV mandate to have zero emissions 
for trucks by 2045. And I'm sure you guys have thoughts on that as it relates to not only trucks, but also autos. Well, yeah, exactly. Uh, You know, here in the Houston area, everybody's going, wait a minute. They're ultimately not going to have somebody behind the wheel of an 18-wheeler. Sometimes I think that an might 80, not be too bad. An 80,000-pound 18-wheeler. Yeah, exactly. We had an incident here a few weeks back where uh, some 18-wheeler driver, I guess, lost his mind on drugs or something, parked the thing in the middle of the freeway, and then ultimately had to have a one-armed bandit from the police department open up the entire side of the uh, of the 18-wheeler to drag this guy out of there after the dog went after his head and they let it loose a four hour major freeway shutdown. So, you know, there are goods and bads when it comes to 18 wheelers and automation and that sort of stuff. But that's the way things are going though, because behind the scenes, and I don't think most people really realize that is the fact that they are working on a a driverless tractor trailer and all over the major centers where transportation is key. And let's just use Amazon. They must have two dozen Amazon facilities right, here in the right, Houston right, right. area alone. Huge, huge. And, and there is a perfect example of something that could really use uh, an automated system. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And, and that's exactly right. You're tugging on the point, which is there are trade-offs. So there are going to be amazing things in that, you know, there there's not necessarily – Uh, sufficient driver population as drivers retire. A lot of truck drivers are getting older and they're not filling back up those ranks to the extent necessary. So, you know, here's a way that we can magnify the population by having an automated sort of opportunity. On the other hand, what is the risk profile of the driving public if they know that next to them is a 80,000 pound truck that doesn't have a driver, right? I mean, it's the same thing as if you've ever been in a driverless car or seen a driverless car, you sort of feel like how uh, you're worried, right? Even if it maybe is supposed to be more reliable than human, uh, you're still a little concerned about it. It's hard from a public perception to accept that. Well, and then the the driver, you know, people do dumb things when there's a driver in the 80,000 pound truck. How dumb are they going to be when there's not somebody in the 80,000 pound truck? And how is it going to react to the stupidity of people? Sorry. You're exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, how many how many car radio talk shows do you get on that you're able to chuckle at some of this stuff and you have to have I a know. sense of humor? I listen, we're in a brave new world, right? And and the fact is there's such tremendous things we're, we can't be gloom and doom. There's lots of fabulous things to look forward to. However, all of this comes with uh, with trade-offs, as we talked about. I mean, the other thing, too, is you probably know that the trial lawyers are always looking for new industries to pursue. And so if we, the broker, contract a driverless truck, well, and something were to happen, because we all live in the land where something happens, does that mean that we get sued because we made an unsafe choice by using a driverless truck, right? I mean, these are kinds of the considerations. So Unfortunately, there's probably going to be some kind of regulatory angle or, or or litigation angle here in the future, even if there are a lot of benefits. Yeah, and then there's Jim Adler, the Texas Hammer. You know, <laughs> he, he's going to sue the daylights out of everybody. And will he be standing on a driverless truck? <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so, Anne, um, let, let's talk for just a second about – uh, you mentioned it about the the shortages of products, uh, and and I'm not talking about microchips coming in from China. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about you know seat covers or uh, car polish or whatever it yeah. may be. Um, you know we see trains going up and down the track. What happened to the transportation industry when uh, we had that whole pandemic shutdown for a couple of months? Yeah, it was. We call it the perfect storm. So it was all kinds of shortages from top to bottom. So driver population shortage was first and foremost, actually getting trucks moving. Then there was a, uh, you know, mineral and supply shortage, meaning the trucks were actually like to make the components of the trucks. That was that was lacking as well. And then getting the commodities that they were, you know, stuck in China in many ways. Right. Many times they were stuck there or they were stuck in other places and we couldn't get to them. It, it just was kind of like 
from top to bottom. There weren't sufficient people in a in a warehouse. There weren't sufficient people driving the truck. There weren't sufficient commodities to carry. There weren't right and on and on and on. And so it took a while for the supply chain to figure it itself out, right, right the ship, so to speak. I'll say one other thing. No one was getting their hair cut. No one was going on trips. No one was co- prevailing upon any services. So what did they do with all their disposable income? They just bought a bunch of stuff. I'm sure you were sitting at home and you're like, you know what? I hate my dining room table. I need a new dining room table. Or I hate my carpet. I'm going to get a new carpet. Whatever it was, everyone was buying stuff. And so the volumes were unprecedented. We have never seen the amount of volumes in 2021 and 2022 Um, uh, Well, and it's not surprising, and I hadn't thought of it that way, that people were at home. So what do you do when you're at home? Shop you, on Amazon. Well, shop, shop on Amazon. Wayfair. Or, or, you know, yeah, yeah, wherever. But you buy all of that stuff online at, or, you know, have the services like carpeting. No, you don't think about it. Where is the carpet made? How does it get here? You don't think about that. You go to Home Depot and there's a whole big rolls and rolls and rolls of it. I'll have that. Put that in there. So one of the things you've now mentioned about three times was the shortage of drivers. Um, Does your organization do anything trying to help grow the amount of drivers available to the industry? Yeah, I mean, what we can do is be supportive. Since we don't own trucks ourselves, we just contract to hire them. We can be supportive of, for example, the USDOT did a pilot project of allowing um, men and women 18, under 21, basically, to be uh, registered as truck drivers across state lines. Um, Right now, they're not allowed to, so they started this pilot project. And Quite frankly, it makes all the sense in the world. I mean, if you have an 18-year-old who's going to Afghanistan or or what have you, and they can't drive a truck to another state, that doesn't make any sense, right? So we tried to exp- help to expand that population. Um, and then there are other things we can do too, is which is supporting their various schools that are teaching CDLs, and so mm-hmm. we're supportive of that. I mean, from our perspective, whatever we can do to have the next generation go into these lines of work, I mean, selfishly, we want them to be logistics professionals, but we also want them to be truck drivers because otherwise that's, you know, 80% of our members are relying on them. So that's what we try to do is just be supportive of those opportunities. Where do you get an education in uh, transportation, uh, whatever you called it? Logistics? Logistics. Where do you you get an education in logistics? Because that is a... Besides Rice University. Besides Rice University. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. But but seriously, I don't know. How would you get into that sort of thing? Well, see, that's exactly right. So that's part of our that's part of our education campaign. TIA has its own education resources, but these are typically people who are already in the industry. But to get into the industry, we're actually working with various universities. For example, University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, they have part of our education to teach their you know undergrads ha- to have a logistics degree. But there are other programs that are famous for their logistics programs. Uh, University of um, Denver is another one. And and so these schools, University of Wisconsin, University of Michigan, they, they all have supply chain schools. And so we think it's probably kind of next step for us is to see how many universities we can work with to provide our educational resources if they want, to, if they choose to. I mean, they're already that have that have a ton of, of, of logistics professionals and resources they don't necessarily need us but we that's where we think the next generation of folks is coming from but why but it, would but it why like... wouldn't it be uh, more focused on or at least partially focused on community colleges bringing it back home oh, to those yeah. that aren't going to have a four-year degree that that's a great point and and i don't th- i think we are sort of um, agnostic on whether it's a an elite university <laughs> or or if it's a com- you know a community college quite frankly whatever educational resources we can provide we don't have a, a, we are not snobbish about it. We were, we'll happy, we're happy to provide anything that we can because ultimately that helps our profession. And, and, you know, you may or may not experience this with, with what you're dealing with, but there's a lot of fraud in the industry. There's a lot of fraud in the supply chain. And so if we have a really professionalized um, group of folks of logisticians, as they call them, that ultimately benefits everybody, including the reputation of our industry, but also the end user and the end consumer. Yeah, because a degree in logistics and supply chain is going to be much more valuable than a degree in French Renaissance art. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, it, hey, hey, hey. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, does somebody have a degree in French Renaissance poetry? That makes me think of Groundhog Day. The, 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 <laughs> <laughs> I think of croissants. Yeah. Croissants, yeah. that's it. But, but part of it, uh, I was kind of amazed because I did not know until we started talking to you and, and, and even today even more, the 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 amount of information that I don't have regarding logistics and the supply chain and things, you know, stuff comes in on a boat, somebody takes it off, they put it on a truck and it comes yeah. to Walmart. That, sure. I mean, that's what I think a lot of us think about. We don't understand all the intricacies all the steps. No. that there may be 25 or 30 people involved to do that. Well, well it's well, also got to pass through customs on the way too. Well, not only that, but I mean, you got to have, you got to get it off the boat. You got to load it on the, onto the containers and you got to get it to the trucking company and then you got to get it. You know, there's just the fulfillment center, and then they deliver it. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, and, and that's why you know, if you're, let's say you're Walmart, why would you work with a broker? Well, the fact is because we are that transportation department. So you you just listed like seven steps, and so our professionals are the ones who can figure out the best path forward from you know the boat to the store and what the lane should be, how fast we can do it, who's the best carrier to use. All of that stuff. That's why they turn to a broker as opposed to having an enormous, you know, transportation department themselves. They're going to go to us and say, "Just take it off our hands. We don't really, yeah. you know, you're, you're the ones. You're who the know. professional. Yeah, depend you know on the, you're it. the subject matter expert. Depend on them to facilitate and all of that. Does for it you. matter that if it's maybe like a refrigerator size and and maybe a price point versus maybe like a, a pack of napkins or a pair of socks or something? There, is there like a priority on what gets sent, or, or is it all loaded together and moved? Oh. So it really just depends. I mean, we have what they call truckload, which would be one truckload filled with the same thing. And then there's less than truckload, LTL, which is a service that essentially is, all right, you think about like the milk truck that has to make a lot of stops. It's sort of the equivalent of the milk truck that has to make a lot of stops, like the local truck that that has, all right, we're going to stop here and drop off the napkins. Now we're going to stop here and we have a pallet of, you know, mallow bars. I don't know why that just came to me, but you know, I love Mark. <laughs> <laughs> right. So that's sort of, that's how it works. Whereas there's a service that you can provide. And then you think about like oversized and overdimensional freight, for example, those wind turbines that you see all over Texas. Mm -hmm. Well, there's our specific equipment for that. So our members would know, all right, I know which carriers have that specific equipment. And so I'll be able to work you know, to get those things moving, whereas the wind turbine people, they don't know. They, they, that's not their business. Their business is making wind turbines. And right. so they rely on us to say, all right, we're going to take that, you know, and, and get it going. So is there one point that there would be a, a, a truck line maybe developing a type of transportation for that wind wind farm or maybe uh, an oil field company that has a specific product or machinery that needs to go on a specific truck? I mean, is that all part of it as well? Yeah, I mean, so we have a member, actually, he just testified in Congress this past week um, about the supply chain. It, the company is Tucker Worldwide, and um, the, they have a pharmaceutical business. And so there's very, very specific, specific trucks that um, you need to move pharmaceuticals, right? For example, the, vac the COVID-19 vaccine had to be refrigerated at a certain temperature, and so he had access to all of that equipment because of his experience with pharmaceuticals. So my point is you have, if you have a dedicated customer and that's what they do and they work with a broker and they say, I, I know I can trust you because I know you've got access to that equipment. It sort of takes a load off their mind. They don't have to worry about it. And then that, you know, it allows us to do what we do best. I think one other thing I'd say is all of this stuff that we're talking about, the various steps, we collect data about it, and so that that data then becomes really meaningful to help us know how to do it better and how to sell our services to others who may be in the same business. And how it impacts the end user's cost because transportation is also considered part of the cost of purchase. Mm -hmm. you know, that's right. And now with all of this mess that's going on in the Red Sea – and oh, instead God. of <laughs> passing through the Suez Canal they in go around three the, days, now they got to go around, around the Cape, Cape Horn, yeah. Cape Horn oh, through yeah. South Africa. You know, that's adding time and money, cost, yeah. which to translates everything. to money. And a delay in yeah. the mallow bars.
bars. And a delay in the delay mallow bars. In the mallow bars. At what least the it? vanilla portion of the mallow bars coming out of Madagascar, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So it's, it, we provide such a tremendous benefit. And again, I know that a lot of people don't think one red second about where anything comes from that they buy at the store. But I do think that there is gradually become an awareness, again, because of the pandemic. And we, we didn't have access to stuff that we always had access to. Toilet I mean, paper. I'm sure we had, like, yeah. that we had bizarre, um, not to, I, I have nothing wrong with the country of, of Turkey, but we have this weird Turkish um, paper towels. And it's like, why, why am I having Turkish paper towels? Where's my bounty, right? I mean, you exactly. know, it's just all of it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's when you start thinking about these things and you start yeah. wondering. And like I say, I just in, in looking, talking to you and looking at the background material, it's just like, I never knew that. Never thought about that. Well, and to go back to something you mentioned just uh, a few minutes ago was the truck that delivers multiple different things to people. Somebody has to plan how to load that truck properly. Right. So as they hit each stop, that's the next thing coming off the truck. So that's some yeah. of the that's logistics exactly right. you've got to facilitate. Now, the well. real reason that we called you today and <laughs> wanted to talk to you besides the Mallow Bars and, and, and Rice <laughs> University Owls and that sort of thing, uh, are you really pulling for the Baltimore Ravens today? No, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, where are you located? I mean, I, look, I have, I have nothing against the Ravens. I, so I I did spend some formative years in Texas. So I, I have a sweet spot for the Texans. Go Texans, right? Yeah, that, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. They had a blowout. That was incredible. Um, but I am a Redskins slash Commanders fan. But we've had, what, 35 years? <laughs> Sorry to of, hear that. <laughs> of mediocrity? I know. God help us. Well, We're on the ascendant. You know, we're on the ascendancy. Yes, yeah, right. Listen, yeah, when you're at the bottom, you're it's always looking up. <laughs> and any time that you want to come on the show, you just let us know. We don't even have I to will. talk about TIA. We'll talk about Mallow Bars and the Texans. And as they say in Texas, bless your heart. <laughs> well, by the way, I, my son is, uh, I have a seven-year-old son who's so obsessed with Hot Wheels. It's unbelievable. And I, I kept calling. I was like, Mommy's got to be on the Hot Wheels show. And he's like, oh, God. Sure. <laughs> What's his name? What's your son's name? Wyatt. 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 What's going on, Wyatt? <laughs> That's it. Shout out to Wyatt. <laughs> Shout out to Wyatt. And it's been a real pleasure, a real blast. Real Thank pleasure. you so much. It's a pleasure to meet you. And anytime you're in Houston, Texas, come and see us and be a live guest in the studio. I will. I will. Let's go to Ninfa's together. Ooh. Yeah. Hey, hey. Ninf- yeah. Well, uh, Lupe Tortilla. We're Lupe Tortilla fans. Oh, oh that's right. That's one of your sponsors. So yeah. <laughs> that's, that's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll treat you to Tex-Mex, so come on down. And a yeah, mellow bar. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And thanks again. Thanks so much. Have a great day. You, you do too. the same. How much fun is that? Yeah, yeah very cool. Okay, uh, time now for Conrad's Car Clinic. What? It's the car clinic time. Uh, what are we car clinicking today? Well, we're going to talk about your car when it's freezing outside. All right, that's good. You know, uh, uh, the first instinct before driving anywhere may be to let your car warm up, but that might not be such a great idea. According to experts, uh, the engine only needs, um, you know, less than a minute to reach all of its temperatures and getting mm. all the fluids flowing Does correctly. it matter about age of the car? It doesn't really matter okay. about age of the car. So once the fluids get flowing and everything's working, which happens, you know, short Shortly after you start it, <laughs> like um, you're morning. good to go, right? <laughs> uh, you know, the other thing I wanted to talk about is is your windshields. So, you know, when it's this cold out, now we didn't see it quite this cold, but I've I've had some. Uh, uh, some frost on my car. Well, when you have these little marks in your windshield, the the little chips and stuff, you know, you got to be real careful how you first off clean the windshield and second off how you defrost the windshield. So if you put your defroster on max get it temperature and then crank it up, there's a high probability that little rock chip is going to spread to a big, long crack, and that's going to go across the windshield because you got to remember a windshield is basically two pieces of glass with a piece of plastic between mm-hmm. them. The film. So if you heat the inside glass up faster than the outside glass, the inside glass expands, and that will basically run those cracks. So instead of cranking it up to 90 degrees to heat the inside windshield up, just set it on 60, 65, let it eventually eventually come up to temperature. It really doesn't take that much longer to melt the ice off your windshield because you definitely want the ice off your windshield before you head on down the highway. A plastic credit card will get the a, ice a off the windshield. Full credit card, yeah. Full tilt boogie. That's Do not lived in San Antonio. One of these little cold fronts came through. 
one morning I backed out of the garage and that rock chip went all the way across just to hit the sure, car there. Because you yeah. can just kind of hit the flex in your car as you're backing down the driveway. And it makes and a very unique sound. Run here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, being careful uh, with how you defrost your windshield is important in these days. That's a, that's a very good information. Thank I like you. that. Yeah, that was good. Um, yeah, and, and it'll also make you have to change that cracked or, or damaged windshield quicker mm -hmm. yep. by doing it that way. So if that's the case and you've got insurance, then crank it up to and 90 degrees. You bet well, you. and those those uh, people out there that can fix the rock chips, do it. Because I, my opinion is it's yeah. probably stronger than it was before because they pull all the air out of it and fill it in with a glue. Allegedly, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Allegedly. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. You're welcome. That's Conrad. Yeah, that was Conrad. All right. Because <laughs> nobody else wants to be. Parts customer who bought oil not recommended by his vehicle's manufacturer cannot pursue a negligent misrepresentation claim oh, no. against the Canadian dealership that sold him the oil. An Alberta judge has ruled Justice George Shannon of the Provincial Court of Justice rejected an attempt by Jamal Al-Rafi to hold Calgary BMW responsible for catastrophic damage mm. to the engine of his 2006 BMW M5 sedan. The decision, said El Rafi, uh, failed to produce evidence. The dealership made an untrue, inaccurate, or misleading representation that caused his misfortune, nor was there sufficient evidence that the wrong oil caused the damage. The suit alleged that in 2019, a parts department employee at Calgary BMW advised El Rafi to switch from 10 W60 oil called for in the owner's manual to the less expensive 5W30 oil. El Rafi bought the 530 oil at the it's dealership, which an independent mechanic used for the oil change. However, the decision said the employee merely told El Rafi accurately that BMW USA had transitioned to 5W30 and that BMW Canada might do the same. Well, it wasn't good. I thought they were sealed probably systems. a $25,000 engine. Aren't they sealed M6. systems? Yeah. In dismissing the suit, Shannon cited the absence of testimony from the independent mechanic. And uh, it turns out that uh, the guy hadn't changed the oil in a long, long time. Oh and when he did, he went to 530 and it plugged up the whole thing and it over revved the engine. Wow. It did all sorts of things and all sorts <laughs> yeah. of ugly damage. I'm, stu Our next I'm guest stupid and I want to blame somebody head. else. Story. Exactly. Yeah, I drive an M6. <laughs> a quick break now. You're on the end wheel time car talk show back mm -hmm. after this. Rev your engines and set sail for the ultimate surf and turf. The Houston Automotive Show, January 24th through the 28th at NRG Center. One ticket gets you into both the auto show and the boat show. See your favorite car and boat brands under one roof. Learn about the latest electric vehicles and test drive one with Evolve Houston. Board your dream boat and check out the bass fishing demos. It's the Houston Automotive Show, January 24th through the 28th. Buy early and save at AutoBoativeShow.com. You own a car you love. Well, why not let Gulf Coast Auto Shield protect it? Houstonian John Gray invites you to his state-of-the-art facility to introduce you to his specialist team of auto enthusiasts. We promise you'll be impressed. Whether you're looking to massage your original paint to a like-new appearance, apply a ceramic coating, install a paint protection film, nano-ceramic window tint, or new windshield protection called ExoShield, Gulf Coast Auto Shield is where Houston's car people go. Curbed your wheels? Instead of buying new, why not have them repaired? How about a professionally installed radar detector? Gulf Coast Auto Shield does that too. Get a peek inside the shop and look at the services offered by getting online and heading to gcautoshield.com. Better yet, stop by their facility at 11275 South Sam Houston Tollway, just south of the Southwest Freeway, and get a personal tour. Gulf Coast Auto Shield is your place to go for all things exterior. Call them today, 832-930-5655 or gcautoshield.com. The original group of Loopy Tortilla Restaurants will have you telling your family and friends just what the original recipes mean when it comes to the best fajitas in Southeast Texas. Founder Stan Holt invites you to visit the original Loopy Tortilla near I-10 and Highway 6. Here's the original house that inspired the design of all the rest and the original charm that helped make Loopy Tortilla the go-to destination for Houston Tex-Mex. Speaking of original, nothing can compete with the original lime pepper marinade that everyone will agree makes Loopy Tortilla award-winning beef fajitas the best anywhere. 
Loopy Tortilla Katy is another location that gives you the same quality and service Houstonians have come to expect at Loopy's. It's located just off I-10 of the Grand Parkway at Kingsland Boulevard in Katy. Find yourself in Aggie Land? Head to the Loopy Tortilla and College Station, located just around the corner from Kyle Field. It's a great place to enjoy those famous frozen margaritas before or after the game. Headed east to Louisiana? Stop in at the Loopy Tortilla in Beaumont. It twos on I-10. You can't miss it. The original group of Loopy Tortilla restaurants invite you in for the best Tex-Mex anywhere. That's it for this podcast episode of the In Wheel Time Car Show. I'm Don Armstrong, inviting you to join us for our live show every Saturday morning, 8 to 11 a.m. Central on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and our InWheelTime.com website. Podcasts are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeart Podcast, Podcast Addict, TuneIn, Pandora, and Amazon Music. Keep listening, and we'll see you soon.